Ladies and gentlemen, we have uh, our next speaker. I would like to invite on stage Professor Winka Bigo. Ma'am, if you can hear me, I hereby request you to please switch on your video cam. She'll be speaking on discipline helps in failure management. Okay. Thank you so much, uh, Ashwati. Oh, ma'am. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you so much for taking out your precious time and joining with us. Yeah. So can you all see my screen? It's my yes, screen we there. can. Okay. So I should... Do Before we start, I'm, I'm just going to give a brief introduction to our audience about you. Yeah. She's an associate professor in Embodied Leadership and Corporate Liberation at Ketch Business School since 2010. She holds a PhD from Cambridge University after a career in finance. Her current research centers on embodied learning, the ethics of care, philosophy of science, leadership, silence, and liberated entrepreneurship. Her teaching commitments include embodied leadership, liberated entrepreneurship, yoga, and collective intelligence. Ma'am, before we begin, I just want to say that you have 20 minutes for the speech and Next 10 minutes will be dedicated for the Q&A session. So please, I request you to adhere to the timelines as we have time constraint. And uh, with that, I hereby hand over the stage to you. It's all yours. OK. Yes, thank you so much for the invitation. Um, and so, um, yeah, I was listening with great interest to uh, the other speakers. Here we go. Um, and uh, I am, you know, interested. I was especially with the last speaker. I was expecting something much more technical, and it's something uh, quite psychological, spiritual. Uh, so I was surprised, but uh, but delighted. A lot of it seems to be uh, definitely focused on uh, personal, deeply personal, intimate experiences. Um, meaningful ones. So let me uh, launch into my presentation. Um, I have to say a couple of things about myself. I used to be um, in finance in my early days and I moved a long way as I'm now also a yoga teacher apart from teaching leadership uh, at Sketch Business School. Um, and during my uh, presentation, I'm going to be sharing some thoughts on duality and non-duality, uh, as the case may be. Uh, and there is something about you know, the, our world being heavily polarized, and polarization starts inside. Um, so I'm going to be saying a lot more about that um, during my presentation. This is where my latest research has taken me. Um, so the global trends, uh, I'm not revealing anything by, um, you know, if I share these observations that we are so hyper-connected through the media, the internet, the social networks, uh, and it, there's an acceleration process that probably hasn't um, it hasn't yet seen um, its full its fullest development. Um, there's an urgency to slow down. I often tell my students, uh, and I try and apply it to my own personal space uh, as well as my professional space. It's a world that's increasingly complex, uncertain, and we all know uh, increasingly unsustainable. At least the way that we live in this world um, is increasingly um, difficult to sustain. So the COVID pandemic has um, produced a sp very specific condition, which is confinement. Confining half the world's population is, is quite a feat uh, from one day to the other um, in the name of health. Um, and I think what you know we can liken it to an unchosen spiritual retreat such as Vipassana, which is a retreat that I've 
um, that I've attended a couple of years ago in India. Um, and it was a voluntary 10 day confinement. Uh, and it's very confronting, um, even though I chose it. And um, many times I wanted to just walk out, and, you know, and I have been meditating um, for many years, and yet it was very difficult. So um, clearly, those who haven't chosen the confinement, um, there have been difficulties, uh, very personal difficulties being confronted with ego mind situations or the, the stories that our ego is telling us. And, uh, but at, you know, at the same time, it was difficult to escape from one's inner demon through actions, through socialization, through leaving the home, through being very busy at work. So this, it's been a, a, a difficult but interesting space for many people to explore. Uh, some of there's some there's some positive outcomes, but some of the darker outcomes include uh, depression and anger and illness and suicides and divorce. Um, so we're with all that, and it was always present, but the pandemic has has uh, made that. Um, more salient, perhaps. So, Sri Sri Thakur Anukul Chandra says character and conduct with their due behavior indicates one's psychic atmosphere. So, what is it about our own psychic atmosphere, whether it's anger or um, the way that we live our values through virtue, ethics? Um, what is it about? this cycle of atmosphere that um, we can investigate and do something about. Uh, and that is really how can we address um, some of the crises that we're facing, um, which are to do with superficiality and lots of meaning. These are some of the, the, the trends that I have identified, stress and burnout at work. Um, illness and even suicide, violence and danger and fear. There's a lot of fear behind all of that, of course. Uh, and all of these could do with you know, some unpacking. So given that the title of my um, stream or of my talk was going to be around discipline and failure management, um, as, a, you know, as a, response to, a response to what's going on, um, I clearly, as, uh, as as David indicated also, he was talking about uh, the commitments, uh, diarying about the commitments. So discipline here I take to be is a commitment to higher values through daily action. Um, there is no commitment without action. Um, it, it's not worth it for the commitment. And, especially daily action. What we do every day makes us and shapes us. Um, and even if it's a tiny, tiny uh, effort that we make on a daily basis, it's uh, this personal hygiene. And I often encourage my students to make a 40-day commitment so that um, something can really begin to shift uh, in, their, in their being towards going uh, where they would like to be uh, in their lives. And they, they're facing you know, basic experiences, daily anger and frustration and stress and lack of sleep. And I'm bringing them back to this commitment, to this discipline, which is a word that this um, can be, uh, discipline can be very repressive. The discipline, obviously, uh, in spiritual practice is something that, is, uh, that we know is, is very valuable. Uh, and is required for what I call change makers, if we are to bring about a different kind of world. Um, the leadership, um, how does one remain serene? How does one hold up? So clearly, I espouse what uh, David was saying about the you know, values and the value system is, is required to anchor some kind of loyalty to 
something really important within ourselves and that is in line with a service uh, that we can, a contribution uh, that we can make to humanity. Um, and that in turn can be expressed in a daily commitment to a meaningful practice. Okay. So in my research, um, I've looked, I've explored three dimensions along which this commitment um, can be uh, fulfilled. Uh, and there's an understanding, particularly around the non-duality of body and mind, self and others, and action and non-action that I find in the Advaita Vedantic ontology, um, which you know I thought was quite radical um, and well worthwhile exploring, both in practice. Uh, I found it resonates very much with my practice of meditation and yoga, and um, and as something to uh, impact, uh, to make sense actually, to give direction um, to one's actions in the world. So, um, commitments, not just the first axis, is then recognize this mind body uh, dualism. How can we translate it to? mind body uh, union so we all for those who have experience in meditation um there is something that happens when we meditate where we focus more on our much more on our, on our five senses it's not the only way to do it but to focus on one time um, but the, with the effects that you know, to quieten both the mind and, and the emotions and um, this, this is uh, one way to see the world as it is, rather than how we wish it to be. It's connecting with the here and now of what's going on with the way that the body is experiencing the world, the body as truth better. So it has the possible effect of stabilizing our emotional and psychic reaction to what is and to act on what can be changed. So you, there's a recognition, there's an acceptance and then an agreement to act on the basis of something that's real. And we can become creative rather than reactive. Um, and the body, you know, we've come, we've come to uh, live this life with uh, a physical body and in this, the five senses are so fully connected to the physical body and there's no need to or it would be incomplete not to um, integrate the physical body in in our in our practice um, and in what it tells us so the second dualism um the second axis um, of commitment i think should integrate uh, would be helpful to integrate this this recognition that uh, there is no real separation between ourselves and others and ourselves and nature. Uh, and as long as we don't realize that there is, we're left with often a sense of isolation and loneliness. Uh, but we're not. We're not separate either from each other or from nature. So looking um, after, in turn, if we look after others and nature, it means that we should also look after ourselves. Um, and we should do so again on a daily basis. Okay. And the third dimension for creating a commitment that is meaningful, um, I like this quote from Bhagavad Gita. He who perceives inaction in action and action in inaction is wise among men. And um, you know, especially in Western capitalism kind of uh, business uh, context, the, the tendency is to see organizations as machines that can be controlled rather than living organisms with human beings that can be trusted. 
Um, so there is another way to act in the world, which is to have a quality of presence and that's activity uh, that involves listening much as, a, as an orchestra conductor would do. Um, and in that listening, you can develop your intuition uh, rather than control. Uh, you can have an intuition and sense of foresight um, and there is something more, definitely more fluid uh, that can happen in such a place. This quote here, which uh, came out of one of my studies from uh, a leader that has uh, put trust as a central value in his organization, he says, I want my employees to express themselves without fear. And he said he began to listen. I mean, he really began to listen. And in the end, he found that their creative self, with their differences and their quirkiness, they began to show. Now, these employees began to take initiatives, and um, the consequence was that there was less need to, there was more commitment and less need, or no need perhaps, to control. Uh, and more creativity, so less needs to act. And um, so action and non-action, uh, can they can they somehow uh, be placed on a continuum? Um, and active listening being at the center of action. So as I see, it's now 15 minutes nearly, but I'm close to my conclusion. And um, which is that, so, you know, the confinement reveals things that are already there uh, at the personal and the collective levels, deep fears and anxieties, and how you know, the challenge clearly is, how do we hold up as change makers, as people who are um, deeply concerned with the way the world is being run and, and um, the, the challenges that we're facing. And so to, to bring discipline in as something uh, with, that has a, an elevating dimension uh, is, is an interesting take uh, to manage failure, at least in, to maybe prevent failure using um, intuition and creativity rather than reactivity, um, using a focus or a reconnection with a full reconnection, a conscious reconnection with the body um, to be able to recognize reality as it is and not react to it with emotional and um, ego based reactions and then to really act on it. And um, can we have on a daily basis of practice that that uh, allows us to, to um, on a daily basis, experience the non-duality of body and mind, of self and others, and of act action and non-action. Um, and, um, you know, there are many different uh, personal practices that can do so. Uh, I, I meditate on a daily basis and do yoga, but there is something about stillness that comes with confinement. And how do I, how do I deal with being still? Um, so I think I just want to leave it there. Uh, thank you very much for for listening. Um, and that I want to just close with this final quote uh, by Sri Sri Thakur. Uh, achieve discipleship. How, you know, it's about obedience. Uh, achieve discipleship of the master, the guide, in thoughts, words, and action with every interested urge and have discipline. Thank you. Ma'am, we are quick, quickly going to take one question. Sure. This is from Kulanti. She has asked from US Is it an achievable goal? To have zero fears and anxieties. To have, sorry, to have? To have zero anxiety and fears. <laughs> okay, that's um, the question. Fear is something we need in order to survive. Um, and 
there is something that is as an animal uh, it's related to instinct possibly to uh, being being afraid and our second chakra can do very instinctive stuff the reactive stuff so fear is a healthy reaction to start with but we live in a world in which we have all sorts of fear to the being fueled by by the mind um playing ping pong with the emotions and you know if it's if you have zero fear and anxiety you know you might say that you've reached awakening um is it a realistic goal i think it's a very noble one um, and i don't really need to know whether i can achieve it in this lifetime or another lifetime um, but i um you know it's a path it's a path and it's something to keep in mind that uh, we can certainly reduce the fear and the anxiety that that we're experiencing um, to the extent that it's not a contribution to a better world That's, thank you so much ma'am yeah i hope that answers the question so do i <laughs> I really want to thank you for your insight, the insightful uh, presentation.